peoples of the world, is it better to save millions of lives or save the wealth of a few? This is the subject matter of my treatise. We are faced with a situation like nothing this generation has ever faced before. We are seeing the epicenter of the coronavirus outbreak shift here to the United States. The human crisis continuing to unfold though in Italy and in Spain. Absolutely harrowing pictures. In Lebanon, demonstrators have taken to the streets to protest the economic crisis in the country. At least one protester has died in the unrest. The coronavirus has only added to the country's economic woes. The world risks a famine tragedy of biblical proportion due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The warning comes from a United Nations study based on the new Global Food Crisis Report. The worst is yet ahead of us. It's a virus that many people still don't understand. Only a few people alive today experienced the Spanish flu pandemic, which was said to have claimed over 50 to 100 million lives. We ought to have learned some lessons from that, but history teaches us that men don't learn lessons from history. During the final months of World War I, more soldiers died of the flu than were killed on the battlefield during four years of fighting. As the death toll here in the U.S. has now passed 50,000, several states have begun lifting stay-at-home orders, allowing some businesses to reopen. The decision to ease restrictions comes against the recommendation of experts. Time for our state to be opened up. We're tired of not being able to buy the things that we need, go to the hairdressers, get our hair done. It's time to open up. The whole world now faces a common foe, or probably a common blessing, depending on how we choose to look at it. Disunited nations are now more disunited as they employ desperate measures to save their citizens and economies. The Prime Minister basically closed the country to most of the world. Starting Wednesday, Canada will be denying entry to most foreign nationals. Why do you keep calling this the Chinese virus? It's not racist at all, no, not at all. It comes from China, that's why. Our minds struggle to understand the maths of exponentials Today we hear of the index case and tomorrow we have thousands of cases. How did one index case turn to millions in such a short time? A connected world never knew how small the world had become with the advancements man had made in science and technology. Our biases binded us to our brotherhood. Hence we forgot that tens of thousands of miles apart merely meant a few flying hours. We were closer than we thought we were. History teaches us how at different times nations of the world came together to confront common foes. This is how the League of Nations was better and later the United Nations. Nations fought wars to defend their definition of the common good and now nations must fight another war to defend the common good. It then becomes pertinent to understand what the common good really is. Who defines the common good? The rich and mighty nations of the world? or all nations of the world. I know our world has been ravaged by unending conflicts in the Middle East that should meet the standard definition of the common good. I know that the unnecessary deaths in Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan and all other warring nations meet the standard of common good. I know that the disparity between rich and poor nations, rich and poor people meets the definition of common good. I know that the elimination of malaria, HIV, sickle cell and other diseases meets this standard of common good. I know that combating hunger, starvation and famine we see in some nations meets the definition of common good. I know that ending the greed of capitalism meets this same definition of common good, the same way rejecting the racism espoused from the bully pulpit of the president of the world's most powerful nation meets this same definition. Donald J. Trump is calling for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States. When Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. They're not sending you. They're not sending you. They're sending people that have lots of problems and they're bringing those problems with us. They're bringing drugs. They're bringing crime. They're rapists. We see the same racism in the visa restrictions rich and powerful nations impose on smaller nations. They have plundered and pillaged in the past. 
In recent weeks, several Nigerians have been denied entry to America. A special advisor to the Nigerian president says no reasons have been provided for denying Nigerian citizens entry into the U.S. The common good is collectively ending the debt enslavement of poor nations. The common good is rejecting the recolonization of Africa by China through Trojan horses, disguised as loans. The truth is that our world has long been threatened, but we all chose to turn the blind eye because it didn't affect us. More people have died from hunger and starvation in decades past than will die from COVID-19. But because the disunited nations of the world didn't come together then, they now find it difficult to come together now. Tens of thousands have died in Nigeria from the Boko Haram war as a simple collaboration between countries of the world could have stamped out in days. The same way all other wars could have been ended if the world came together in love and honesty. The United Nations General Assembly was turned into a theater of grandstanding and eloquent speeches while our world burned. We all have a responsibility to collectively hold any government, however powerful, accountable for the consequences of its destructive unilateralism. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't mean to take away from some of the good the United Nations has done but they could have done a whole lot more if all nations were truly equal in that hallowed chamber of injustice, inequity, and inequality. We have long heard poor nations and poor peoples groan under the weight of loans, tyranny, and oppression, and we chose to say they are paying the price of corruption. Silence in the face of injustice, oppression, tyranny, racism, and any form of inhumanity is the worst form of corruption. And now, here we are, facing a threat against our common good. It is our common good because we are all affected. The origin is not as important as the solution. The solution is so simple, yet so difficult, because we have not the practice of being a United Nations. Nations all over the world are implementing disparate measures to confront this desperate situation because of the disparity between nations. Most rich nations are able to enforce some kind of lockdown but we can see their economy is groaning. The mind of man now swings between the love of mankind or the love of mammon or capitalism. Should we allow the death of some for the greater good of the economy? This is a question before most of our governments today. It is a question of human lives versus capitalism cloaked as the economy. The word economy is used in this case to deceive the masses that it is our common interest and heritage at stake, whereas we all know that a few people control most of the world's wealth. At the same time, we hear the United Nations warn of anarchy and salvation in Africa as if warnings without action means anything. We have always known Africa was the weak link and we're okay with it because Africa was far removed from us, except when our television sets grace us with those images of hungry children with flies are done in their faces. Is it possible to now save the world without saving Africa? I don't think so. When I saw what China had to do to, to isolate such an enormous part of their population, my first thought was Africa. How in the world are they going to deal with this? It's gonna be horrible in the developing world. And part of the reason you're seeing the case numbers still don't look very bad is because they don't have access to very many tests. So, you know, look at Ecuador. Look at what's going on in Ecuador. They're putting bodies out on the street. You're going to see that in countries in Africa. This is the truth we all know, but run away from. All current lockdowns are totally meaningless, if not uniform across the world, and are a temporary measure to reassure a G3 people. COVID-19 is here to reset the world. It is a simple problem with a simple answer. It is that four-letter word that binds all men and holds the promise so true to a better world. It is the four-letter word that all religions preach and very few practice. COVID-19 begins and ends with love. This same love will stop evil men from using this as an opportunity to stoke the embers of war between the United States and China or China and the rest of the world. To all those who see 5G and all other conspiracy theories behind this, I remind you that our skies are blue again, our waters are calm, 
our earth is green, our family is united, and the poor are fed. No invention of man could have given this outcome to us. Our world needs to reset to the factory settings of love of humanity. COVID-19 will only end when all nations of the world shut down at the same time for a minimum of eight weeks. Why is this not the hot button topic? Why is this not the discussion of the day? Every day. Apart from stopping the spread, this time allows the earth to heal, our bodies to rest and families to be whole again. This is the only way to stop the spread. But something so simple is so difficult because not all nations of the world can afford to truly shut down for eight weeks or more. What happens to nations whose majority live day to day in poverty? Those nations would implode in anarchy and revolution. What happens to the conflict regions of the world? Who tells them to shut down? This brings me back to the subject matter of my treatise. Is it better to save millions of lives than to save the wealth of a few? Over 200,000 people dead, and as usual, we have reduced the dead to statistics, charts, and graphs. Somebody please wake up. The numbers are rising daily, and we'll be talking about millions dead in just a few weeks. They are not just numbers, they are human beings with names like Mike, Alfred, Margaret, Musa, Alice, Emeka, and Cheng. They lived meaningful lives and had dreams. They left families behind, children, wives, parents, siblings. Their lives have to count for something. These United Nations, some rich, some poor, now have to be a United Nations, solving the problem of the poor and vulnerable nations in love. For only after that can a United World shut down and stay still before God. When we learn to love ourselves, our families, our neighbors, our world, COVID-19 will go the same way it came. So my dear United Nations, the choice is yours. You can save millions of lives and your economies by solving the problem of the poor nations of the world and then proceed to shut down. Or you can let millions of people die while you work on a vaccine that will be ready in a year to 18 months. The choice to save mankind has and will always be that of mankind. We owe it to ourselves and generations unborn to make the right choices at this time. We can be the United Nations. Never again shall we allow the greed and evil of man threaten our existence. We must stamp the words never again in our hearts as our daily anthem going forward. People of the world, never again, never again, never again. God bless you all.